Hey there, I had the opportunity to go visit the Southern Exposure Seed Exchange in Virginia and it was just a fascinating experience uh, and I really am happy to share this with you guys. They are located in Virginia, as I said, and one of the few seed companies in the southeast and so they really specialize in getting seed from growers in that bioregion and so that's really fascinating to me personally and to connect with them. They're also a worker run cooperative. Uh, Irina showed us around and it was just super neat because she was able to talk about a lot of stuff that was even applicable to small scales. So we're talking threshing, winnowing, storage of seeds, that kind of stuff. And if any of you guys have ever grown anything on a commercial scale or even a small backyard garden scale, you guys know how cool all the little seed packages are. And so for me to like walk into a room of that, I was just like, wow, this is so cool. But it was really neat to me to see, um, you know, the bulk storage of seeds, the sort of sorting, and packaging and storage of all that stuff and so it's a lot of really interesting stuff that you're going to get out of this one and if you guys aren't already subscribed to the channel it would be greatly appreciated if you guys could do that thanks otherwise let's get on to the video hope you enjoy I'm Irena Hollowell. We're here at Southern Exposure, the worker cooperative seed business where I work. We sell mostly to home gardeners, but also to small farmers all across the U.S., but with a higher concentration in the Southeast than in other regions. And our selection is based on what does well on our farm in Central Virginia and what we expect will do well in other parts of the Southeast. One of the reasons why I'm here is that there aren't a lot of seed companies in the Southeast, and mm -hmm. so how do you guys um, change the way you either, you know, get seeds from other growers mm -hmm. or, you know, the varieties you select? Mm -hmm. can, you, can you talk a little bit about that? We work with a lot of different farms. We do trials on our own farm. For example, this past year we grew about 60 kinds of peppers on our farm and about 40 kinds of tomatoes to compare them to each other, to get notes and pictures for our catalog and website, to decide which of the ones that we grew that we don't currently carry, we want to add to our selection, um, and to eat them on our own farm, and also to take them to tasting events, um, the best known of which is the Heritage Harvest Festival in Monticello. So uh, we do trials of a lot of different kinds of crops every year um, to assess which varieties are best suited for our region um, and getting seeds that are well suited to your region is going to be really important in terms of disease resistance if you want to grow stuff organically um, and also a lot of the modern varieties on the market are bred as much for shippability as for anything else so we think it's really important to keep older heirloom varieties that are selected more for taste and for disease resistance out there are most of the seeds you guys are selling heirlooms or are you selling some hybrids as well? Uh, we have a selection of over 800 varieties altogether and um, the large majority of those are open pollinated. Almost everything we sell is open pollinated and you're never going to accidentally get a hybrid variety from us. Of the approximately 800 varieties we sell, about four of them are hybrid varieties and we specify in the name, you know, right with the name of the variety, that those are hybrids to make sure you don't accidentally get something that you can't save seed from. Um, because hybrid varieties, if you try to save the seed from them, they won't come true to type. The seeds that you get, um, the, the crop that you get from the seeds that you would harvest would not have all the same qualities as the crop that you get from the seeds that you buy in the first place. Um, so most of your customers, are they going to be uh, home scale gardeners? Are you selling to small farms? Mm -hmm. um, is it mostly in this uh, geographical region? Um, it's in a very wide geographical region, but more in the southeast than in other parts of the country. Most of our customers are home gardeners, but we do also sell to a lot of small farmers. We work with about 60 small farmers who grow seeds for us. 
Um, it really increases the range of seeds that we can offer to be working with a lot of different small farms and not just getting seeds wholesale from big companies. Um, it really makes it possible for us to sell a lot of varieties that are like better adapted to our region than what we would be able to offer otherwise. Um, and we buy seeds from about uh, 60 different small farms all across the country with um, higher concentrations in the southeast and in the Pacific Northwest than in other regions. We have a higher concentration in the southeast because this is where we are, this is where a lot of our connections are, this is where the conditions are more similar to what so many of our customers are growing in, and um, in the Pacific Northwest because in climates that have a reliably dry part of year, it's a lot easier to harvest seeds that mature in dry pods or in the open air without letting them get moldy. Okay, and this is a very unique company because you mentioned it's a co-op, but there's also a community of people that live here too. Can you talk about that? Yeah, the Southern Exposure is cooperatively run by the members of Acorn Community. We're an intentional community of currently about uh, 20 members and a few guests, visitors, and interns at any given time. Um, we organize ourselves um, collectively with all of the jobs being counted as um, of the same value. So, you know, some people might work a lot more in the kitchen or in construction and other people more in the seed business, but whether you're packing seeds or doing marketing or cleaning the kitchen or weeding in the garden or planning what we're going to plant next year, an hour counts as an hour. It's a rainy day today, otherwise we'd be showing mm -hmm. you outside, but there's lots of cool uh, growing going on outside too. Mm -hmm. And some of that's for field testing, mm -hmm. um, different varieties, and some of that's for growing food for your own community. And some of it's for growing seeds to sell. And also, a lot of the seeds that we grow on our own farm, a lot of the time, um, you know, a lot of our own seed grow arts are smaller than most of the seed grow arts that we contract out. Um, so our farm and some other farms that also work on a very small, you know, with, with a very small scale grow outs often do, um, some of our smallest grow outs are often for a seed that will then be given to another grower so that they can grow the seed crop that we will end up selling in our catalog the following year. I can't wait to go look around. You're going to show us around all sorts of different stuff. So yeah, let's go check it out. When seed arrives on our property, it shows up here on our loading dock. And then we take it either to germination testing or to our seed drying room to cure and get drier than it is, especially if it's from one of our seed growers and if we have any unsureness about whether it's already dry enough. Or it goes to what we call the receiving area where it gets um, put into buckets and jars and such and has little vinyl labels put on it so that we can keep track of it in our seed storage area. This is a converted trailer that used to be roadworthy, no longer roadworthy, but still has all the insulation that made it nice to use as a refrigerated trailer in its previous life. And currently it's our seed storage for um, the seed that's um, ready to put into packets that's still in its bulk size containers, seed that we've gotten from seed growers across the country and also from wholesalers. These are some of the smallest containers we use for seeds that haven't been yet put into packets. Um, and like most of the smallest containers we use, this will be going in the freezer, which we keep at about uh, zero degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so what temperature is it in here for bulk storage? In here it's in the winter, it's ambient temperature. Okay. Um, in the summer, we try to keep it um, below 60. Okay. Um, in general, it's good for seeds. They'll last longer if they're stored in a cool, dry, dark place. Okay, so are you dehumidifying this area too? Yes. Okay. We're doing more to make it cool than anything else, but it's also consistently dark and it's also pretty dry. Our seed freezer has most of our relatively small containers of seeds so it has most of the smaller seeded crops that we have in storage, most of the peppers and tomatoes and things in the brassica family, and um, most of the flower and herb seed that we have in containers ready to be put into packets, um, whereas most of the larger seeded things like corn and beans and cover crops are in the main part of our trailer. Seed that's stored in the freezer will keep for longer okay. than seed that's stored at relatively higher temperatures. So at home, should I be keeping my seeds in the freezer? If you can keep them in an airtight container and make sure that moisture doesn't condense on them, 
including when you are bringing it up to temperature. So like when you're taking your seeds out of the freezer, we recommend letting them get up to room temperature before you open the container to make sure that moisture doesn't condense on the cold seeds once the air that has more moisture in it finds its way into that container. Makes sense. This machine is called a winnow wizard. It's used for cleaning seeds to get the chaff off of them. And uh, mostly we use it for larger seed, seed lots that we grow on our own farm. It's also been purchased collectively by uh, four or five farms in the area. So we all use it um, for seeds, mostly for seeds that will be sold through Southern Exposure. Um, but other farms in our collective also use it for seeds that they're uh, growing for other small companies. And um, basically the Winnow Wizard has a motor over here that blows air through here and uh, the seeds fall down, or the seeds are put in the hopper here and then they um, fall through this apparatus and have air blown across them to remove the lighter weight chaff from the heavier weight seed and in some cases to remove relatively lightweight seed from the heavier weight seed because lightweight seed might possibly not be fully developed, it might be um, eaten a little bit by bugs, it might be in some other way less than fully desirable. Um, generally the better seed is heavier. So how much, like what percentage of your seeds are passing through this machine? Pretty small percentage? Pretty small percentage. Okay. Yeah. And only I certain types of seeds, right? It is useful for a very wide range of seeds, mostly for seeds that mature in dry pods or in the open air because those tend to come with a lot of chaff when they're harvested, with a lot of um, other dry material, the pods that are around the seeds and such, um, and fluff that is around lettuce seeds, and then if you shake the plants, then the seeds fall off, but so does other, other fluffy, lightweight chaff. Um, so mostly we use it for seeds that are, that, that mostly we use the Winter Wizard for seeds that mature in dry pods or in the open air, Whereas seeds that mature inside wet fruits, generally we remove the chaff by rinsing them after fermenting them, and that's a wet process. Um, occasionally we might put those seeds through the winnow wizard if they have a lower germination rate and we need to remove some of the lighter weight seeds. Okay, so for that fermentation process with the, you said wet fruit and seeds, is mm -hmm. that done here or is that done like for people sending you the seeds? Um, any farm that's growing seeds that mature inside wet fruits would be doing that fermentation process. Okay. So that includes this farm but not limited to this farm. Here we are in the Southern Exposure seed drying room. We have two peanut crops that were grown on our own farm over here. We have many buckets and jars of seeds that came from many other farms that we work with that are you know, finishing their process of drying down in here. More seeds that came from many different farms that we work with. And over here we have quite a few different kinds of seeds that were harvested on our own farm um, that are, you know, drying down some of them already separated from their chaff and some of them not yet. And over here we have a zinnia harvest, zinnias that we harvested for seed um, on our farm that are waiting to be separated from their chaff. This is a jungle striped peanut from a seed crop that we grew on our own farm. They come in some much darker than others, but they're all striped in at least two different colors and very different looking from most peanuts and they have ridges on the shells. If you make peanut butter out of it, what color is it gonna look like? Um, probably it's mostly gonna be based on the color of the inside, which is it's probably gonna be very similar color to any other peanut butter. Okay. And, and depend also on like whether you roast the peanuts first. Okay. Yeah. How's it taste? Very nice. I think they're sweeter than most peanuts are. So it's a pretty rainy day today, so we're kind of shooting this from upstairs in the pole barn, but can you talk a little bit about what's going on out here? So the main area that catches your eye out here that looks the nicest is one of our main food producing areas where we grow, you know, mostly things to use in our own kitchen, but also paying attention to like what the varieties are like, whether we need a nicer picture, whether any of the things we have planted out there is something we uh, could really use a nicer picture of, uh, whether we need to take some more notes for the catalog and website on any of those things. Um, we have, right now, given that it's November, most of the things growing in there are greens and some root crops, and a large portion of them are under Rime, row cover. There are also some perennials, especially near the center. Um, 
a lot of herbs in that perennial area. Um, is it, and are in the, the tunnels, summer, it looks a lot more lush. Of course, yeah, we're in late November right now. Are the tunnels, uh, do they have stuff growing in them too? The low tunnels in the front here, near the front, in the area that you see more diversity in, um, do have things growing in them. Those are um, low tunnels with row cover over them, very temporary, uh, whereas the high tunnel further towards the background um, we were using for some flower seed crop production in the summer to keep the rain off those uh, flower seeds that really um, are much more likely to have a higher germination rate given that they matured without getting rainfall on them. Um, but the high tunnel doesn't really have crops in it right now. This is one of the smaller harvests of this year's seed crop of Siva lima beans um, that we grow on our farm. They have not yet been threshed and I'm going to show you one of the most common methods we use for threshing beans and southern peas. So first of all, I'm going to put these in a pillowcase. When the humidity is relatively high, a lot of things can be harder to thresh than when the humidity is low. So these lima bean pods probably would have been easy, even easier to separate from their holes on a drier day. But on the other hand, lima beans are a lot easier to separate from their holes than most other kinds of seeds that we would do this with. And so what, what happens with them now? Now I'm going to winnow them. Okay. So we could do this winnowing on the winnow wizard that I think you all saw earlier, but for small scale seed processing, this method that I'll be showing is more practical and we do still frequently use it here even though we have a winnow wizard and even though we have other seed cleaning machines. Okay, so the idea here is that the seeds are heavier and they won't fly as far with the fan? Right. Okay. Good seeds are heavier, almost always heavier than chaff. Okay. And usually it takes a few rounds of winnowing to get the seed lock to so be really what are, So what are the subtleties here, sort of the, how fast you shake it out and sort of where you are in relation to the collection? The, the main thing determining how many seeds go in the box and how many go outside the box is where exactly I hold the bucket. Okay. Um, how how high up is one factor. So if I wanted less of them to be blown off, I could hold it here and have them fall less distance. And also, if I hold it um, further in this direction, they'll fall further in this direction. If I hold it further in this direction, they'll fall more in the box. I want to hold it quite close to the edge, um, quite close horizontally to the edge almost directly above this edge of the box, but a little bit this side, so that the heavy seeds will go in the box, but so that most of the light chaff will go outside the box. Got it. A lot of different kinds of seeds 
and that it's often really useful to um, alternate with winnowing is screening. In this case, I'm using um, a bread tray to, um, to screen a lot of the chaff off these lima beans that we winnowed before. seems to work really well. Yeah, a lot of times, the method that, between screening and winnowing, a lot of times the one that's going to work better for you in the next stage is the one you haven't just been doing a lot of. So that makes sense. <laughs> Almost all the packing runs that are under 200 packets get packed by hand, and um, that just involves using a scale to weigh out the quantity of seed, in this case 0.15 grams of lemon bergamot. So is everything done by weight? I see a lot of different measuring cups here too. Is that like, yeah. you know certain seeds, this one scoop of this is? Usually, for, for most seeds, there's a scoop that will, if not consistently get you the, the right weight of seed, will consistently get you very close to the right, to the right weight, and then if you need to add a little more, it's like just a little touch. Uh, so it speeds up hand packing a lot. We use the packing robot for most of the seed packing runs that are over 200 packets. It takes a lot longer to uh, set up and requires a lot more experience to run than hand packing does, but it goes a lot faster. Okay, where do you get a seed packing robot? Are there a lot of uh, companies that make these, or are these custom? There's one company that makes them. Yeah, it's a, it's a very small company. All right, what's the throughput on this? Like, how many packages can you push through a minute, an hour? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't, you know better than me. I guess so the most I could do in an hour is probably like a thousand. Probably a thousand. Does it depend on the, the type of seeds or number of seeds that go into each package? Um, that's, it's kind of depends more on if it's behaving. Okay, it okay. It depends on whether you have to frequently adjust it. Sure. Which depends on many factors, including what type of seeds you're putting through the air. Alright, cool. The main purpose of this room is to store the packets that we have ready for sale. And we have them all organized according to catalog number. All the boxes say the catalog number of the variety on the front of the box and the name. All the packets also say the catalog number on them. And all the catalog numbers that start with zeros are flowers. All the catalog numbers that start with ones are uh, beans and peas and other legumes. Uh, the catalog numbers that start with twos are mostly things in the brassica family at the back of the room over here, like cabbages and cauliflowers. Um, the corns and tomatoes and eggplants all start with four, and all the things in the cucurbit family, like watermelons and cucumbers and pumpkins, all start with fives. To do some other greens, and um, and the okras also, and all of the herbs over here start with seven, and um, the cover crops over here also start with seven. The supplies that we sell for seed saving and for gardening all start with eight, and the books in the hallway out there start with nine. So that's how everything is easy to find so that um, it's easy to train people to put orders together. Okay. Um, so I am like in heaven in this room, <laughs> and I think anyone who grows anything would be like super excited to just even look at all the organization and all the amount of seeds in here. So what are some unique things, and you mentioned this to me before about this space in that you keep this a little bit cooler, you said, right? Then Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we keep this space cooler than the rest of the building because seeds keep better when they're stored cool and dry. Absolutely. And so uh, this space is, we want to have it be reasonably comfortable also for the people, um, but usually it's um, in the in the 60s, I think usually in the low 60s. All right, so you want to share a technique about how to keep seeds... Uh, Story a little bit better? Yeah, okay. how to keep the seeds from getting moist in conditions like in a freezer, for example. Um, when we store seeds in different kinds of containers, some of those kinds of containers have jars that provide a really tight seal against moisture, and some of them don't provide such a tight seal. So, for example, with this sample vial, I'm going to put um, parafilm on it, which is used in a lot of laboratories and also for grafting. I'm going to use it in this case 
from making a really nice seal around this lid of this little jar. Parafilm stretches. As long as I get it all the way around once, it's going to provide a good seal. But with small jars like this, one strip often goes around twice. Cool. So parafilm, pretty easy to get your hands on. We sell it. Um, I think most of the other companies that sell it basically just sell larger amounts than you would probably want in a home garden or for like a small home scale grafting operation. Um, but it is available from other places as well. Okay. And I'm just thinking like more commonly for a home scale, maybe like a mason yeah. jar or something like that. Yeah. A mason jar with two piece lid provides a good seal against moisture that does not require parafilm. Okay, so what are some other containers that people just like whatever, like a yeah. random like Tupperware, Tupperware mm -hmm. kind of thing or? Um, or like, you know, jam jars, any kinds of, uh, you know, glass jar or, or plastic jar that you have left over from, um, from foods that you've purchased or uh, mason jars with one piece lids. Also, we use the parafilm on those. If you're gonna keep seeds in, um, in Ziploc bags, I would recommend double bagging them, at, at least double bagging them as um, a way to guard against moisture, like a way to guard against um, moisture condensing on them while they're in cold storage. Um, so this, um, um, this vials tend to be tend to work better than bags. Okay, and these sealing, this is for going to the freezer or just general um, storage as well? Um, this is for mostly this is for going into the freezer. Um, but for general storage as well, you want to be really sure that insects and rodents aren't going to be able to get into your seeds. Uh, so it's good to have them in something stronger than Ziploc bags for storage outside of pieces as well. Okay, and what are some other uses of parafilm you said for grafting? For grafting, and people use it in laboratories. Okay. Yeah, so I think a lot of the suppliers out there are selling it mostly to laboratories. So one thing that is important to point out here about the company is that really the acorn community here, you know, how it how it's intertwined with the seed company. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the community here? Yeah. So Southern Exposure is owned and operated by Acorn Community. Acorn Community is part of the Federation of Egalitarian Communities and we're an income sharing egalitarian community. So all of the money that comes into the business is uh, shared amongst the people who live at Acorn Community. Uh, mostly it's used to directly buy the things that meet our material needs. So like to fix our buildings, build our, any new buildings, buy the food that we're gonna eat, um, buy the office supplies, uh, buy the, you know, any, any medical and hygiene things that we need, uh, pay for people's doctor visits, etc. Um, we also each get a small stipend for a month. Acorn Community was founded by people who were living at Twin Oaks Community and people who were interested in living at Twin Oaks Community in 1993. Um, for a while, Acorn Community made its money through um, people who lived here having various outside jobs paid um, by the hour or with salaries and um, contributing that money to the community. Um, one of the people who was living here got an outside job with the founder of Southern Exposure Seed Exchange and then later when Jeff McCormick, the founder of Southern Exposure Seed Exchange, decided that the business was getting too big for him and that he wanted to uh, not be the manager of the business anymore, he offered the um, member of Acorn Community, Brian Cricket Rackita, um, he said, he, he asked Brian Cricket Rackett if he wanted to buy the business and um, the reply he got was, well, I live at this community, Acorn, and let me see what they think about that. And Acorn ended up investing um, basically all of the money it had and taking out loans in order to buy Southern Exposure Seed Exchange. <laughs> how, how big is the community here? I'm going to live here. We're, we have, there are about um, 20 members and at any given time, I think usually about five guests, visitors, um, usually about five guests or visitors. Okay, cool. So thanks so much for showing me around today. I'm like, I don't know, super <laughs> cool to see a lot of the stuff that I've seen already today. 
Uh, what are some ways that people can check out uh, both the community and also um, the company if they're looking to get some seeds? So if you want to get, if you want to buy seeds from Southern Exposure Seed Exchange, go to our website www.southernexposure.com. Um, you can browse it easily through, you know, to, to look for uh, different kinds of vegetable seeds and other seeds, and. Um, you can also request a catalog. Uh, we send out free catalogs in bulk mailings and our 2020 catalog is going to be coming out in early December of 2019. We do also have an Instagram account and a Facebook account. Um, I think these days our Instagram account is more active than our Facebook account and we have a blog. If you're interested in exploring membership in Acorn Community, I encourage you to visit um, acorncommunity.org. Look at the membership process pages and also at some of the other pages we have about what it's like to live here. Cool. Well, I'll leave links down below for all that stuff. So okay. thanks so much for taking Great. time to show me around today. Okay. Thank you.